I'm Bob Shrum, the director of the Center for the Political Future here at USC Dornsife. Uh, I want to welcome all of you who are with us and those who are with us virtually on Zoom or Facebook Live for what I hope will be an enlightening discussion on the future of education in America. A special thanks to Jeff and Susan White, whose support made this event possible uh, and made it possible for us to put together a terrific panel. Mackie Raymond is the founder and director of the Center for Research on Education Outcomes at Stanford University, a position she has held since Credo was founded in 1999. Before joining Stanford, she was on the faculty of both the political science and economics departments at the University of Rochester, and her winters were a lot colder. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Darlene Robles is currently Associate Dean for Equity and Community Engagement and a professor of clinical education at the USC Rossier School of Education. She teaches in the Educational Leadership Program and is a faculty advisor for professional development. Pedro Nagara is a leading scholar on race, inequality, and education. He serves as the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, Dean of the Rozier School, and has been on the faculty at UCLA, NYU, where we were both on the faculty at the same time, Harvard and UC Berkeley. He also served on President Biden's Advisory Commission on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics. I will lead a discussion with the panel for about 40 minutes and then turn to audience questions. And I assume, Nicole, that we have someone who will give people a microphone for that. So I'm going to throw out a general question first, and we can just go down the road. How would you assess the state of K through 12 education in the United States. What grade would you give our public education system? Mackie? So I would say we probably deserve about a C minus on average, uh, but I would say that there's a very wide distribution around that. We see n a number of really exceptional examples of positive public education, and we see, unfortunately, a large number of examples of really dreadful public education. Darlene? Um, I appreciate the range that was just said because uh, we have over 49 million students enrolled in K-12 schools. And uh, when I think about education reform, I know that many of the reforms are focused on our urban cities uh, because they educate about nine, eight, nine million students. But take away the 40, 41%, 41 million are in suburban and urban and rural schools, 15,000 school districts. So it's hard to give a grade when you have that variety across the United States. I see some school districts that should receive an A plus, absolutely doing outstanding work. And some that are still struggling for lots of reasons. So it's hard for me to give a grade, but I'm gonna give what I call a grade for effort. Uh, what was not said is I was a superintendent for over 20 years, so I'm going to come from that perspective, and I'm going to give my colleagues probably a B, B plus for effort in wanting, uh, in, in indicating that their commitment to educate all students is really there, uh, and it's difficult to assess uh, a districts across 15,000 districts. Pedro? Thanks for the question, Bob. So I, I agree with... Um, what Darlene just said about the variety of schools. And the real issue in this country is inequality. So where poor kids are concentrated, it tends to be schools are not so good. Where wealthy people live, it tends to be schools are much better. Um, but I, the grade I would give would be a D to the policymakers, because I think that that's where we're really failing in addressing uh, the quality of education in this country. Those who say public education is falling short, uh, promote a number of specific reforms to improve it. Let's talk about some of those reforms, starting with charter schools. Uh, yesterday, the LAUSD school board voted four to three not to allow charter schools to co-locate in over 200 school buildings with public schools. Mackie, do charters achieve better results than public education generally? How do they work and why is there so much resistance to them? Well, that's a huge question, and so I hope you all settle in. Uh, <laughs> so my team uh, at Credo has studied charter schools for the last 20 years, and we've actually published three national studies. And the most recent of those came out about a year ago. 
Uh, and for the first time in 2023, the findings about how charter school students learned compared to what their, their exactly matched kids would look like had they gone to district schools instead, they're getting better results on average in both reading and math than students are in district schools that are nearby. Having said that, one more time, there's a lot of variation around that. Um, why do they work? Well, this is something that I'd love to engage with Pedro about. Um, I think the policy that creates charter schools, which is very, very different than what you find in the district school settings, allows schools to have a lot of autonomy and flexibility and they're much more serious about accountability. Whether that actually works or not, we can have a conversation. But the combination of the flexibility and accountability, allowing schools to operate pretty much on their own, gives them the opportunity to tinker. And what we saw in the data is, it's the only set of schools that we can see nationally that consistently, year after year after year, get a little bit better every year. We see thousands of schools doing that. Not all of them, but thousands and thousands of schools. So I think that the policy element, element that Dr. Nagara was talking about is a really important factor. And I think the personal contribution of educators and leaders in individual schools matters a lot. And the combination of those two things gets us what we see in the data that we reported last year. Pedro, you were invited to engage with that. <laughs> uh, happily. So I actually served as a charter school authorizer in New York. Uh, as an appointee of the governor. Uh, and for four years, I authorized some of the best charters in the country. Um, I was at a charter school yesterday, uh, the Ednovate chain, excellent schools serving low-income kids in East LA. So I agree, there are some excellent charter schools, but there are some lousy ones too. And uh, so I opposed the district's vote yesterday because the truth is that many of the schools in LA are under-enrolled. And so there's no reason why they should not, and in fact, that one of those Edna Bay schools is being kicked out of a building that only serves 200 kids because they serve 1,000. Um, so it's, it's really, I think, a, a short-sighted, wrong-headed wrong policy. At the same time, the idea that charter schools is gonna be the panacea that will save us is, I think, uh, foolhardy. 90% of kids go to public schools and we should be focused on how to improve education for them. Darlene, do you want to weigh in? And Mackie, do you want to respond? <laughs> Darlene? No, please go ahead. Well, uh, at, when I was county superintendent of Los Angeles, we uh, authorized county-operated schools. And based on what Dr. Nogueta said, we had a few that I had to, uh, uh, the one way to say it, defund it or not approve it, and they went to the state. But it was one that was focused on adults, the owners of the charter schools, uh, not necessarily on the students, and there was a lot of complaints. But then also I was on the board of the Alliance for College Ready Public Schools, and they did great work. But what again I noticed in charter schools is that you are doing a sort and select. When you have parents who have the know-how and the ability to advocate for their children, you're bringing students that probably have an advantage over other parents and families who don't have that advocacy or that ability to do that. So you're not getting the, the children that schools are left with at the end of the day. And so we have to be cautious about that because it was intended to be an equalizer, to provide support for those that are more uh, uh, less um, uh, supported by, by systems in the community. So I think it does do good work, that's an example, but it, I think it has failed in what the intent was. Uh, a good friend of mine, many of you may know him, Don Shelby, who was a, absolutely a creator of Aspire Schools in Public Education, recently passed, and I know him, and his intent was not to compete but to show schools how you could do things differently to support more students and students who would not have that advocacy. So I think we have to balance that with the intent of the original statement of charter schools so that it doesn't sort and select and privilege those that are already privileged. That is the equity issue that I wanna focus on, that charter schools sometimes do not do that and are less uh, supportive of those students more in need. Mackie. Okay. Um, so first I want to say, just because we study charter schools 
It's like having a doctor study cancer. It's not that they're pro-cancer. <laughs> Okay, let's just say the, the idea here is the same one that I think we all, every single person in this room comes with, which is we're trying to figure out ways that we can elevate with data about how to improve outcomes for kids, because that's the next generation, that's our economic engine, that's our social and political fabric of our country. We're looking to find examples and opportunities to improve K-12 education throughout. So. I'm not throwing charter schools under the bus when I say that. We just happened to study this group of schools because they were the place where we expected a lot of innovation, and we've seen it. The, the decision by the LA Unified School Board is, I think, shameless politics in the face of just blatant misunderstanding or ignorance of the larger trends that are happening, which is that People are leaving public schools, both charter and district schools, because they're unhappy with the environments that those kids are sitting in. They are, the birth rate is declining dramatically. We have lots and lots of other pressures pushing people out of California entirely. If you look at the out-migration of kids, we see the families that are moving out are the ones that are in school age, have school-age kids. So it's retirees and school-age kids. Families with school-age kids are the two, two groups of folks who are, who are migrating out of, the, out of the state. So the idea that somehow the charter school co-location, which, oh, by the way, is a state law, so I'm anticipating legal action on that, um, is, is going to be overthrown for an, in an attempt to try to retain as many possible kids as, po as, as the district can, can hold on to, ignores the fact that there are real needs to revise the way that education is designed and delivered in public schools. That's a more general statement that we all need to heed. And places like USC, where people are thinking deeply about what we can do, how we can make these changes, how we can get other, other folks to try them, and to build coalitions of support for a larger kind of reform, that's where LAUSD should be focusing, and they're not. They're focusing on trying to cha chase every single dollar they can possibly hold on to without having to change what they do. Can I focus for a second on the innovations and changes that you're talking about and ask what, give me some examples of those that have been pioneered by charter schools and how they made a difference? So, uh, one, one of the new insights from the last study that we conducted was something we call the gap-busting schools. We've known, as was said earlier, that there's a wide range of quality and performance in the charter school population. But we wanted to know, are there schools that are really knocking it out of the park, and what do they look like? And the gap-busting schools are schools that in absolute terms, their schools perform in the top half of the state. So the outcomes that they're creating for kids are positive relative to the state as a whole. And within that, then, can we see that there are learning practices in the school that ensure that blacks and Hispanics learn at least as well, if not better, than white students, that poverty students learn as well, if not better, than non-poverty students. And out of the 6,800 schools that we looked at across the country, we found hundreds and hundreds of schools that met all of those criteria, high overall performance and no learning gaps for kids. Like, that's what we want in our schools. That's where equity sits, and that's the one we want to figure out. How can we clone that? What can we do to find out how to make that the model that everybody wants to adopt? We found the same thing with charter management organizations, that there were dozens that not only got it right in one school, but got it right in all of the schools in their portfolio. So this is the analog of school districts being able to create these kinds of life-changing outcomes for students in every single school that they operated. So, 
I'm not saying that's the only answer, but I think it's certainly an important thing that we want to dig into a little bit deeper and figure out how we can make that much more accessible for other schools and other families to take advantage of. Yeah, I, I want to move on in a minute, but I really am intrigued by this and by the idea that there are innovations being created in these charter schools that I assume could be applied in public schools more generally. Pedro, since you supervised this whole process in New York for a while, what are some of those innovations? You know, I don't want to exaggerate the innovations because, uh, you know, if you go to charter schools, you're not going to come away and say, wow, this is amazing. Uh, most of the ones. I mean, I was very impressed with the school I went to. 100% of the kids graduate and go to college. So that, the results are impressive. The learning model is not that different than what I would see in a public school. They are serving low-income kids, all Latino, these kids in East LA. And that, so it's impressive that, but I think Darlene's point, just that they're low-income and Latino, they're from highly motivated families who are willing to get on a waiting list and, and bet that their kids will get in there. So in that respect, these, you know, in, in the old days, they would have probably gone to a Catholic school, right? But those Catholic schools are gone. So charter schools have replaced the parochial schools in many places. It's important that there be good options. So I'm not against charter schools by any means. I'm, I'm, but I'm still concerned about the other kids because that's what happens when you concentrate a bunch of high need kids in one school. You know what you get? More problems because it's overwhelming to the teachers and the staff because the kids come not just with learning needs, they come with hunger, they come with lack of housing, they come with a whole set of social issues. So in terms of innovation, I just came from LA Unified, had a big event where they announced uh, an AI tool that they're developing that is, they're gonna give to kids and families that will allow them to access all kinds of information in over 100 languages. Now, there's a lot of media there you're gonna read about tomorrow. Will it work? I don't know, it sounds innovative, but we know from many reforms that much is promised, but a lot of times not much changes for, in schools. So we'll see. I don't want to be too skeptical, but um, I have been around a while, <laughs> and I've seen a lot of promises. OK, I'm jumping back in. <laughs> um, so if I understood what you said, uh, the 7.5% of students that are educated in charter schools across the country their families are the only ones that care about what happens to their kids? Not at all. Not at all. That's my point. That is exactly my point. I think families, particularly in communities like LA, where charter schools have been around for 30 years, they know what the option sets are. They make active choices. They may not make the best choices for their kids, but they make choices. And the polling data that we've done and that others have done shows that the American population is highly educated about what options exist in their communities. Um, and whether you're talking about business leaders or community-based organization executives or parents or the mayor himself, they know what the, school what the school options are. And they're also pretty darn good, eh, pretty good, about which ones are good and which ones are not good within a few degrees of freedom. So I'm not convinced that, uh, that there's a selection bias into charter schools. What I would concede, and I think is an important thing for us to continue to, to focus on and to worry about, is that regardless of where they sit, the needs of children and families are not being met, whether it's nutrition or housing or medical care, mental health, you name it. The needs of kids in our communities are not being met. And in any other country, we, those folks would consider that a, a, tra a tragedy and a travesty and would hold public officials accountable for that oversight. For whatever reason, we have cold shoulders in our, in our legislatures about this. We have an inability of, of folks to focus in on the fact that if you don't educate your kids today, you're basically selling off the seed corn of your society in the future. 
Why we do that, I have no clue. But we want to try to solve this problem. That's one of the things we've got to tackle. Darlene, do you have any clue why we do that, if you agree that we do it? I'm going to say that probably people may not like it. It's a profession that is predominantly female. And as a female in the United States, uh, we are marginalized quite a bit. And I think if it was a predominantly male profession, like medical, there'd be more resources for schools. That's just my theory. It's not based on anything, but, but my experience as a female leader in public schools for over 40 years. But I do want to add to what uh, the professor said next to me about why we don't value children in America. Let's just say it. We do not value children. The UNESCO's, UNESCO's report on child well-being recently said that we are out of 29 well-financed democracies and countries across the world, we're 26 and 29th for child well-being. That's an embarrassment in the richest country. We do not value children. We don't value childcare. We don't value health care. We don't value after-school programs. We don't value children, period. That we have to advocate consistently as a superintendent for programs outside of my school to support children's well-being should not be something we should be arguing about every day. They should be there. There should be a community that supports their children from morning till evening. Because when I think of families that I've worked with over time, I'm, I'm gonna give a story because it, when I was thinking about this, uh, Bob, I was thinking of my career as a superintendent. And when I was in Salt Lake City, uh, we had 40% uh, Latinos, low income areas. We also had the wealthy area, you know, the East Bench. Uh, but majority of my students were com come from low income areas. And when the legislature decided to give us what we call compensatory funding, Salt Lake City qualified for quite a bit of that new money. So I was pleased. But the superintendents around me were saying, oh, darling, you are so lucky. You are just so, I mean, you get all the money. And I said, lucky? Lucky that my students, majority of them live in single parent homes in three or four families in one room or in one small apartment who don't have the support when the communities you're talking about, because I knew them, come with families that are intact, well-paying jobs where they can have opportunities. So it's an opportunity gap. I said, my, nothing that I can provide my students will ever compensate for what your families have naturally. Now, I did my best to do that with the money. But we don't care about single parent families who are working minimum wage, no child care, no health facilities that they could go to, no support for families who are at the marginalized area. We just do not care. And it's indicated by every budget that I've seen by state and national federal. They'll give us trinkets of money. Do this, Darlene, do that as a superintendent. But it's not enough to provide adequate housing, minimum wage, health facilities, and things that children need, like eye vision tests, dental tests, medicals, all of that. And it's something that I think as a country, we need to address and just say it. We do not care about our children. And we're going to say that as education reform, because it's not about education reform. I appreciate Dr. Nagata saying, you know, there wasn't anything different in classrooms that are succeeding. There's no magic wand. But what we have is a school that has resources that are providing students extras that they may not have in their local school or local schools. So I think it's not just a reform effort, it's about the will of this country to support children. Okay, I wanna talk about another proposed reform. Uh, in 1992, uh, when Bill Clinton was furiously trying to prove that he was a different kind of Democrat, uh, at the Democratic National Convention in his acceptance speech, he called for school choice. He got a kind of tepid response from the audience but then he said public school choice, and everybody stood, roared, cheered. Pedro, how prevalent is public school choice, and is there a lot of evidence that it's efficacious in changing educational outcomes for students? So I think Darlene said this earlier, it's, it's largely 
now in urban areas, not all, but mostly, um, that you see choice. There are some states now, um, Arizona, Florida, that have adopted it statewide. But you know, if you don't have transportation, you don't have a lot of choice. Right? Um, and if there's no good choices in your neighborhood, you don't have a lot of choice. So it's, it's kind of illusory. It, it, it doesn't mean that you, and, it's, and to go back to what you said earlier about the, the idea behind choice was that you would let parents choose and then the schools that didn't get chosen would somehow go by the wayside. Well, they still exist <laughs> and they still have kids. And it's not like choice has made them better, the ones that are struggling. In fact, so to go to, back to your point about whether or not, see, I'm not against charters. I'm agnost, agnostic on this point. But as an authorizer, I authorize some of the, what are the top performing charters. They're in your report. Eva Moskowitz, who you probably know well, Success Academy Network in New York City. They have a film I'd encourage you to see, Make a Cry, called The Lottery. And it's about families who put their kids in the lottery to get into her schools. Excellent schools. But in the first school that they created, her school's on the bottom floor, doing really well. Right above it is a regular public school. 30% of the kids in that school are homeless. She has no homeless kids in her school. Now, why is it, if it's a lottery, that no homeless kids are in her school? Well, homeless kids, undocumented kids, um, kids whose parents are struggling, they don't go, they don't even know there's a lottery, right? So what's the strategy to help those kids? So. I, again, I'm really glad for the families that are good, uh, lucky enough to get into better schools. But it shouldn't be a lottery that it takes to get a good school. Mm -hmm. right? It should be that, you know, I used to say before the subway got so bad in New York that schools should be like the subway. You get in, in the neighborhood, you can rely on that school. It's a good school, just like the subway. Now the subway is a little shaky now in New York, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to say that. But it, it should be that it's not the neighborhood you live in that determines the quality of school you have. So I would like to just add a little bit to this. Um, <clears throat> I certainly think the notion of school choice on its face sounds appealing. Um, not just from responding to parent demand, but also the supply side. We haven't talked about the fact that part of what school choice is intended to do is to provide different kinds of schooling opportunities, whether it's a focus on STEM or whether it's uh, experiential learning or whether it's some kind of a hybrid program where a kid is at home independent study a couple of days and in class a few days, it doesn't matter. The idea of choice was that you wanted to try to promote variety on the supply side. Uh, on the demand side, School choice obviously is popular. The polling data is extremely strong on uh, public support for school choice. The, the impact of various models of school choice continue to be uh, measured where it's possible. My concern is that a, new, a lot of the new forms of school choice, like education savings accounts, we've got no chance in hell of measuring what's happening to those kids. Those kids are on the vapor, and they're gone, and we don't know what's going to happen to them. We don't know whether those investments are being wisely managed. We don't know whether kids are learning. We don't know much of anything about that. I'm very concerned about that. Within the public school choice realm, we get into slightly different and more political aims because, issues, excuse me, because a lot of places that refuse to have public school choice, even within their own districts, are trying to protect one or two good schools. And what are they trying to protect them from? I don't think we have to connect the dots very hard to know that that's a redlining proposition right there. And school boards support that. School boards are not being sued about that, and they should. Uh, and families who desperately want both a public school choice and a better school choice option for their children don't feel they have a place to go. That is, I think, a major political issue that we have to address in being able to bring the kinds of opportunities that we want for every child to every child. And we're not, we're not ready to do that. Darlene, you want to weigh in, or should I move on? 
Well, I'll definitely weigh in because I had this experience as a county superintendent. When California passed their school choice law in 1983, it was district of choice, it was called. And any board could declare itself through a resolution to be a district of choice. And you could say, my school is open. Well, when there was declining enrollment, this was areas in suburban districts outside of LA, in LA County, not in, not in the urban areas. And uh, all of a sudden, this one district was declining enrollment and noticed that her kids were leaving and going to another district. And the law did not require anyone to keep track of that, like the usual transfers that we had in the past. There would be a permit process. We'd know how many students were leaving, why they were leaving, give information to the superintendent about things, uh, maybe to change in their system to keep their students here. What happened was that this one school took about 1,200, district took 1,200 students. Now the law required, as you said, transportation and that they would take English language learner students, special needs students, students from low income areas. Well, lo and behold, those 1,200 students didn't look like anything that represented what the law said. They were all advantaged parents, advantaged and privileged students. I don't, I mean, I don't, I think it's wonderful that they have everything they need. And they chose not to take one English language learner one student from a low income and didn't provide transportation. But they said, we're a district of choice. You're a district of self-selection is what you are, not of choice for the families that wanted it. Because once you don't provide transportation, how are parents, students gonna get there? So it was a nice ideal because the law, the, the legislation was about equity, making sure all students had an opportunity for a choice. And I'm not against choice or charter schools, having sat on charter school boards, and I believe in choice, but you have to ensure that the students and parents who this law was intended understand and that boards hold themselves accountable to ask which students am we taking in? And they weren't in this one district. My colleague who was superintendent at that time actually took it to the courts. She lost. She tried to get the legislation changed. She lost. And it's still doing something where we're taking, because they don't want to close schools. No superintendent wants to close schools. But they're taking the best and brightest from another district to keep their schools open which means that the schools that were left are still, not that they're not gonna achieve as well or not, but again, you wanna have diversity in your schools. You want diversity of thought, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of economics. You wanna ensure that the schools serve a variety of, 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 uh, of students in, 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 their, in their instruction, but this school was taking it to the limit and it's, it's still happening today even since 2000 when I was, when I was a county superintendent. Bob, just to give an analogy that I think the audience will relate to. So as we had in the lunch, we had choice, and we had lots of dishes out here. But some of the food was terrible. It could get you sick, right? And some of it was really good, but it wasn't enough for everybody, right? And so we would have a big line over there, <laughs> and people would hope, I hope that there's nothing, I don't have to eat that. But that's the way it works in the education. Right? Choice only works if there's all good choices. It, otherwise, somebody's going to lose. And that's what we've done is produce winners and losers. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you a question that's related to this, but go ahead. Uh, can you describe how school vouchers work and in states that offer vouchers, who tends to use them most? And does the research suggest that they, in fact, raise levels of student achievement. Sure, thanks. Uh, so vouchers are an idea that were introduced by Milton Friedman years and years and years ago, um, which suggested that if you allowed the money to follow the child and awarded parents the allocation that would be spent on their child's education, gave it to the parent, and allowed the parent to choose which school would educate their child, that uh, his, his understanding or his gamble was that market forces would kick in. And it's not that the uh, losing schools would close. It was that they would get off their duffs and actually try to improve. I mean, this was a, this was an in, the intention here was market responsiveness, not market closure. Uh, 
Vouchers have been tried across the country in a lot of different places. The record on them is uh, mixed, uh, depending on the quality of the receiving non-public school. The differences can be greatly positive in favor of voucher using students and negative in, in terms of the schools they go to are not as good. There doesn't seem to be a mechanism in place at all to screen the receiving school for some of the same kinds of requirements that we've been discussing here today, whether it's resources or commitment to equity or commitment to meeting student needs. There's no requirement in those programs that kids can't be canceled, canceled or counseled out uh, of, of the schools that they go to with a voucher. So the, the record is mixed. It holds some promise if you actually think about the supply of voucher receiving schools being constructive and positive, then it could be a mechanism for increasing outcomes, improving outcomes for kids. But that safeguard has not been put in place, and the receiving schools resist that in a great, great deal, to a great extent, because they don't want to be transparent. Pedro? So I don't want to put the whites on the spot, but we were talking about the preschool that um, your um, son or daughter was going to send their child to. And it cost how much a year? 60000 Six zero? Six zero. They call them baby ivies. So you show up. I can up do that for 55. <laughs> you show up with your voucher to that school. First of all, the voucher is not even going to get you very far at, with that tuition. But second of all, just because you have a voucher doesn't mean they're going to take you. Right? Part of what makes those schools exclusive is they exclude. <laughs> they exclude people they don't want. <laughs> right? You have to interview. A three year old has to interview. And they need to be able to count and impress. And so, again, it, it sounds good on paper, <laughs> but in practice, what really concerns me, and there's some evidence this is happening in some states that have implemented vouchers, is it becomes a subsidy to families that would have gone to middle school, private school anyway, to reduce the burden on them. And, and you know, I'm all for reducing burdens, but let's do it again equitably, right? Let's make sure everyone is getting tax subsidies um, and other ways to get access. But bottom line is we've got to come up with a better way of delivering education to people in this country. And, and it shouldn't be a crapshoot. Darlene, people say, or critics say, that vouchers weaken public education by diverting resources from public schools. And you've talked a lot about the shortage of resources today. Is that your view? Well, I, I think it segregates. <laughs> I think the privileged and people of ethnicity and low income are not going to be part of that voucher. And if we're going to sustain a democracy, we have to really be clear about what our purpose of schooling is and what we're doing to support everyone, from regardless of what ethnicity, what income, that we're all in it for the common good of this country. And right now, we're segregating. We're saying, if I'm more privileged, I want to only be with privileged people. Or I want to be with people who look more like me or have similar values like me, another negating others who might. So I think it's a, it's a conversation we have to have about why that exists in terms of markets. And I, I don't believe there should be a market. As a principle, I would compete with the best. If they want to leave, I, I would, they wouldn't leave my school. I had permits wanting to come in because I was going to do the best I could. I was not afraid of competition. Not every principal is that way, but most superintendents are that way. But again, if you are going to have a voucher and it's going to help segregate it by ethnicity and by income, I don't think that serves our country well at all. I really don't. I so why think is it we the be more diverse and be more accepting and giving pe everyone that opportunity to be in a school? It should not just be by luck. It should be intentional that every school uh, provides the best education for the students in their community. So why would you deny the students who are able to get the better education? Why isn't the solution that we fix the systems that don't provide that level of quality education for our kids. 75% of the students of school age in the United States attend district schools, and 40% of those schools 
are underperforming in the ways that we're talking about today. Think about the millions of kids that we are stranding. And so I frankly think that vouchers are not nearly the threat that people are screaming about because they simply are not that, that much of the, of the pie. The big pie is the existing set of schools today that year in and year out, cohort after cohort, pass kids through without giving them the skills and the knowledge that they need to have lives of opportunity. And we tolerate it and we allow the same folks to sit in the same adult seats year after year after year, even though we know the data say they're not getting the outcomes that we want. Let's have that conversation because that's the fix we need. If we can fix that, we will have the equitable society that we're looking for. And it's not that I think that the concerns that are being raised aren't justified. I just think it's the wrong place in the pie to be focusing. The focus has to be on the existing district schools that are not actually performing anywhere near the way we need to. And so we have to have a conversation about the adults because it's the adults that are doing it and they're doing it to the kids. Uh -huh. I'm gonna turn this over to the audience in a couple minutes. But, and I can't cover everything I'd like to cover, but there's something no one has mentioned here. Uh, can, can each of you give your take on the role of teachers unions in all of this? Uh, Pedro, you wanna start? Sure, I, I think um, it's easy to pick on the union. And, and, uh, and I do a fair amount myself because I think, I think that's the reason why the district, LA Unified, passed that policy, to appease the union. Um, and I think there's a lot that needs to change, but you can only change the union if you start to respect teachers, <laughs> right? That is, if, if as a society we really invested in education so that we could attract our best students into the teaching profession, then we could also adopt laws that made it easier to get rid of people who were no good and made it more difficult to get into the profession in the first place. We could be more selective. Right now, it's, uh, we have a, ver a system where we're so desperate for teachers that pretty much if you have a bachelor's degree and you're breathing, you're going to get a job right? in most places. And this is not the way to build a great system. And the union spends most of its time not only defending teachers, but mostly defending retirees. And, 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 and that's what their interests are. And, and you know, so my criticism of, of, of the union is they should be defending education, not just individual members. Because if they could improve conditions in schools, they would make the lives of teachers better. But I would say many unions have a very narrow agenda, which is to take care of their members, especially the retirees. Darlene? Having worked in a right to work state and, and, and in our state here in California, uh, right to work, you walk like a duck, act like a duck, you are a duck. They still acted like a union, even though it was a right to work. Unions exist for a reason, as, as Pedro said. They exist for a specific reason. Your rank and file teachers I have worked with really do want to do their best. And they will give me examples of when the principal that was there was not supportive or the board was not supportive of something. They give real reasons of why they're not feeling successful or supported. But your rank and file teachers get up every day wanting to do their best. They don't get up every day trying to say, I'm gonna ruin it for Darlene or for Pedro or for Margaret. They get up wanting to do their best for the students. And we know that our parents send us their best. Parents every day send their children, that's their best to us. And so until you can make that relationship work in one that's supportive and, and understanding that teachers also have a very difficult job. We're not valued, going back to my statement here, because it's a female profession, in my opinion. I have no basis for that, no theory, no facts, but we don't treat our teachers with respect at all. We allow parents to come in and berate them, say things about them, attack them, and sometimes the principal's strong enough to say no to Mrs. Robles, or just kind of manages and has Mrs. Robles, the parent uh, uh, appeased, or the board asks you to do that. It's again, it's, we need to respect the profession because it is a profession that, uh, that has a set of pedagogy, a set of standards, a set of uh, instructional focus that should be valued. They didn't just come out 
and decide today one day to be a teacher. Maybe in some cases, as you say, Pedro, we're hiring just about anybody right now. But it is a profession that should be valued because without it, we're not gonna be able to sustain uh, our democracy and more important, we're not gonna be able to educate our students the way we want to. I should note that, by the way, we, uh, as I understand it, pay our teachers decidedly less than a lot of other advanced countries. Um, Korea and the, the Scandinavian states would be examples. Well, what's your take on teachers union and the role they play in all this? So it probably won't surprise you to know, as someone who actually believes that competition is a good thing, um, that I think unions <clears throat> Uh, have overgrown their utility. I think their best value is in protecting salary and benefits for their members. Um, I think the, uh, the reach of teachers unions in many parts of the country have gone way beyond that. And I'm not even talking about you know, conditions in the classroom. I'm talking about using uh, member donations to fund political campaigns out of state so that they can try to move a political agenda uh, that is more national in scope, which I think is just flat out atrocious. Uh, I think the unions have not been leaders in the conversation about improving outcomes for kids. And I think it's so short-sighted because they have such an incredible span of line of sight, of reach, of influence, if they could come up with policies and ideas about how to, imp how to meet the needs of students and families and move to positive outcomes, I think the dollars would flow exactly the way that they hoped they would. I don't think that teachers are, uh, first, I don't think teachers should be equ uh, equally compensated. I think that that should be tied to how well they teach, how well they serve the profession. I can see dual tracks for compensation. I also don't think that teachers should just be, their, the end of their professional status should be the day they get tenure. I think that there is a long progression of opportunity and seniority that they can create within the, the ranks of teachers and within the ranks of school leaders, and that we should recognize more, uh, more effective, more more experienced in terms of being able to produce better results, I think we ought to actually recognize that in a compensation scheme so that we recognize and, and reward the better teachers, the more richly endowed teachers. I think we should be able to do that. But that doesn't fly, that flies in the face of the protectionism of unions where they're really not trying to protect the best teachers, let's be clear. They're trying to protect the teachers that aren't very good. And if we could address the value and the importance of having good teachers in every single class, and if we could get unions to get over that hump, they are the only group that requires every single teacher to be treated as though they're effective. No other profession expects that. If we could get over that hump, I think we would have a lot of room to move in collaboration in order to create the kinds of better outcomes that we all think are necessary. Uh, let's turn to some questions from our audience. I'm, we're clearly not going to solve everything. You have show, Nicole will bring you a microphone. Hi, uh, great. Th thank you for this really fascinating panel. Um, and um, I just, I guess I have two questions, probably more, and wish I had more. Let's see, okay, talking into, okay, yeah, thanks for a great panel. Uh, I wish I had more time to like get in a lot of questions. Probably have two main questions. One, uh, wh why don't we have like a uh, universal ID system so that for tracking outcomes and you know, maybe even to like, uh, yeah, why don't we have that? And then who ultimately right now is the main um, auditor of outcomes. Is this at the state level or is this at the federal level or is it just local? Because I think that's uh, kind of important. Thank you. Who, who wants to take this? That's a good one for Margaret. <laughs> I'm the designated hitter here, is that it? Okay. Well, well you got nominated by Pedro. <laughs> it, the state keeps the data, so it, it's, it's public data. So there's two different ways that, that performance is measured. One, at the individual student level, states assign a unique student identifier, but every state has their own system. So if kids move across state lines, we can't track that. 
within states to the extent that that system works well, and most of them do. You can actually watch a kid, even if they change districts, you can watch a kid go through their K-12 um, career, and you can find out what happens to them. At the national level, we have this National Assessment of Education Progress, which is a test that's given um, periodically to fourth graders and eighth graders um, in reading and math and a couple of other subjects. That's a sample that's supposed to be nationally representative and oversampled in order to be representative of a number of different cities within the country. Those, those data are completely equivalent across, across the states, but the state-to-state -state data is not completely equivalent because they use different tests. Okay, um, another question? And you have to give people down in front a chance too, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, a comment. LAUSD has been notoriously irresponsible in authorizing charter schools. For example, there are very few underserved students in Pacific Palisades, but yet Pacific Palisades, all of the schools, high school, middle school, elementary, they're all charter schools. So it's going to be interesting to see what LAUSD does with those schools that have been converted from regular public schools to charter schools. Are they going to be required to move out? It's an interesting thought. So my question is this. We had an extensive amount of very effective brain research in the 1990s that informed educators. And I'd like to kind of switch to a question about curriculum and instruction. What do you feel was the impact of that brain research on teacher education, on curriculum and instruction, and on outcomes? I'll just share what we had. A, we had a, 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 an expert at LA County Office of Education in the brain research, um, and also for gifted and talented students as well. What happened is that in the in the NCLB era, there was such a focus on standardized testing that the brain research was put aside, so they didn't do the training that was needed to influence what teachers needed to know. So standardized testing took a took away a lot of that creativity, that innovation, that ability for teachers to use this research or even attend trainings that we offered at LACO uh, because of standardized testing. It was teaching the test. People were looking at it as an evaluation mark when we get a grade level, you know, an A, B, C, or D, uh, whatever that ranking was gonna be. So we didn't do a good job in the 1980s. I think now it's coming back because of the focus on well-being, being connected, that students have to have a sense of of, um, of, of being in a, a safe place and belonging so that they can be connected. It's when students walk into your classroom, given where they brought, came in, do they feel engaged? Do they feel loved and cared for in the classroom? Can they center and focus and begin to learn? And teachers understanding that I think is becoming more uh, uh, prevalent now than it was in the 90s. Because not that standardized testing is still not a priority, but it wasn't, it isn't like it was in the, in the 90s. So I think we hopefully we'll see more of it. I would just add a question about the, the charter schools. The Palisade schools, they're all district charters. Yeah. So they, they're not going to be affected by this. It's going to be the other charters that are, uh, like the ones I was at yesterday, Innovate, they're going to be affected, but Palisades is safe. <laughs> so I just want to say one thing about the Palisade schools because they're actually, um, in my mental map of charter schools across the United States, they stand out as a very unique cluster. Do you know how they got started? The teachers said, turn us into charter schools or we're all leaving. I mean, think about what that says about teacher power, that you could think about groups of teachers saying, we're not doing this anymore. I don't hear about that very often. I've heard about it in a few places, you know, onesie, twosie. Palisades, I think there's six schools, am I right? Six schools in Palisades where the teachers were like, nope, we're out of here unless you, go, you let us have the flexibility we need. But they're all in the same union as the rest of the district. I understand. <laughs> but it's still teacher voice in a way that you don't see. Yeah, so we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so I want to preface this by uh, apologizing for kind of how leading the language of this question is. Uh, but um, the question is, do you believe, and if the answer is yes, to what, ex to what degree 
that schools and school districts are more concerned with chasing impressive and funding attractive statistics, like 100% graduation, rather than engaging with their still growing students and aiding them to kind of discover their academic strengths and understand their own learning abilities. So this, is, uh, uh, this builds on the point I think Darlene was making. When you, if you say we're going to judge schools based on the test scores, then they're going to focus on how to raise the scores, which makes sense. What they're not sufficiently focused on is great teaching and learning. Okay? So my question to the parents here, how many of your, how often do your kids or grandkids come home and say, what a day. It was amazing what we learned, what I read. That doesn't happen enough. And it's because I think we have focused on the wrong thing. It, it's like, if you want to lose weight, you don't just focus on the scale. Right? You focus on diet and exercise. In education, we focused on the scale, on the test scores, because that's what we get judged by. We haven't focused on the quality of teaching and learning. How do we make kids more engaged? How do we give teachers the support they need so they can deliver high quality instruction? That's what we should focus on. And it's not to say we don't assess. We have to assess to know how kids are doing. But we put too much emphasis on that and not enough emphasis on the work of education. Uh, one last question. Maybe over here. Yeah. Thank you. I fe think I feel a little depressed. <laughs> so. I, I wonder whether the audience member and you, the experts, will walk away shaking your heads a little bit or acknowledge that humankind determines the, th the, the, the plan of things. Are we going to solve all these issues that you raise and all the ones you haven't raised? Or are we just, is our fate to do the best we can do? instead of trying to solve everything. Mm. I, I'm, I've been in three districts in the last two weeks. Three districts in the last two weeks, very, very different. Uh, one in a high school district, one in a suburban district, one in an urban area, you know, four districts I've been involved in, and then one in a, a large elementary school district in a, in a neighboring county. And I'm optimistic because I saw four superintendents with very diverse uh, communities, really focused on pushing forward um, support for giving more teachers more autonomy to do more and not focus on their test scores. Yes, it's important to have to measure, but it isn't like in the 90s where everybody was, you know, if you didn't have a test score, you'd be an F and you're gonna, your school was gonna be closed. So I'm optimistic that the four superintendents that I spoke to and spoke, and spoke to their staff, that they're providing more um, autonomy, but also understanding that they have to give more resources and support to their teachers and their principals to be um, innovative, but as important to feel that it's okay to make a mistake and you're not gonna lose your job. How will they do that? Well, one example was providing um, the teachers this opportunity to say, I, one superintendent said, I take, took the yoke off their, their neck. You want to do this? You want to create this ethnic studies course and you want to focus on Korean heritage and you're going to include others there? Go for it. Do it, support it, whatever whatever feedback or whatever criticism I'm going to get, I'm going to support you. The board's going to support you go do it. And things have changed tremendously in the last three or four years. In fact, this superintendent said, we don't even look at test scores. Everything that we're doing on the whole child has shown that our test scores have been maintained and still improving over time. So that's one example. Another superintendent at a, at a, at a, a large district, and I know Pedro know who, who this is, is he's providing his teachers with a full payment of a reading, author, reading language authorization, authorization to make sure that every teacher K-12 is going to be, if they want to, be given the opportunity to become reading specialists 
so that reading scores can go up. In the three years that they've done it, they've seen in two years, reading scores have gone, gone up. So he's supporting his teachers to become better equipped to do that, to provide interventions for their students. So these are just two examples of two districts, but again, I can go more, but, but, but again, they're really beginning to, I mean, they've always been this way. I've known the superintendents for a while, but more and more superintendents are doing that from my, my experience. Mackie, can I give you the last word? And then I'll bring this to a close. Well, I think I join Darlene in being optimistic. Um, one of the things we haven't really talked about is how difficult the organizational structure of the federal, state, and LEA organization is on what happens in schools. And my team at Stanford has spent the last year working with experts around the country to come up with a new idea. We're calling it a new operating system that actually gets a lot of that impediment out of the way. And in fact, the word autonomy is music to my ears because what it's doing is it's elevating the experience of teachers and leaders and putting them on a professional development pathway, part of its training, part of its better results for kids, that actually can align adult self-interest with the outcomes for kids that we care about. And if we can get everybody on that page, I think we have an opportunity to create much stronger communities of educators, communities of parents and schools working together, and communities in our country. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna thank uh, our panel for a terrific discussion. Thanks to all of you in our audience or remotely. Uh, and I wanna add that I, I believe we should probably cooperate with, we haven't solved all the problems here, we don't agree on everything, but I believe that we should cooperate or collaborate with Rogier on doing a real like half day or three quarters of a day on these issues and really delve into them. Uh, I think it would be terrific. I'm fascinated by what I've- Can I share one thing that you, I think everybody, at least connected to USC should be proud of? The number one feeder high school to USC is an inner city public school, Foshe High School. No other elite private university could say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, that, that's terrific. And, <laughs> and what USC does to help students in this neighborhood, less advantaged students in this neighborhood, end up getting a, a, a pathway to a good college education is amazing. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I say that with no disrespect to the USC of the North. Um, <laughs> Hang on. Uh, I want to invite all of you to join us for our next event on March 26th at 5 p.m featuring Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass in conversation with Michael Tubbs, a spring 2024 fellow at the center, the former mayor of Stockton who did so much to revitalize that city. Thank you all, have a great afternoon, and I wish we could keep going for a few more hours. <laughs>